SpaceX gets approval for more flights from Vandenberg, European companies study big reusable rockets, China reveals the latest changes to its Chongzheng 9 rocket and it looks familiar, and Blue Origin stack New Glenn for its first flight. We'll have all that and a whole lot more this week in Spaceflight. Rocket Lab wants to retrieve samples from Mars. During an earnings presentation, the company announced that NASA has selected it to study if it would be able to perform the Mars sample return mission quicker and cheaper than the current mission architecture. Currently, the mission is projected to cost $11 billion, and it's expected to bring back the samples by 2040 at the earliest. Now, as you can imagine, NASA is eager to get the samples in the hands of scientists earlier and at a lower cost. Rocket Lab believes that it's well positioned to perform this mission, as it does have a lot of relevant experience through the the companies that it's bought over the years, some of which have actually contributed to many recent missions to the Red Planet. With this experience, Rocket Lab expects that it can deliver the samples to scientists a lot sooner than the current timeline and at a fraction of the currently budgeted $11 billion. But this wasn't the only thing Rocket Lab updated its investors on. Aside from the all-important financial updates, the company also shared its progress on the development of its reusable next-generation rocket, a methane-powered medium-lift vehicle called Neutron. Recently, Rocket Lab successfully completed the first wet dress rehearsal of Neutron's second stage. This test put the stage, its avionics, and its propellant management systems through their paces in flight configuration. Neutron's first stage is set to perform a similar test. It isn't ready just yet, but Rocket Lab has completed the fairing for the first Neutron. This carbon composite shell, or the hungry hippo as Rocket Lab calls it, protects the payload on the way up. At stage separation, it opens to release the second stage and its payload, but it stays attached to the first stage for easy reuse. Meanwhile, the company is getting Neutron's launch pad on Wallops Island in Virginia ready for action and is working to install the launch mount sometime in the coming weeks. This steel structure holds the rocket down as it's getting ready for flight, and weighing in at 165 tons, it should be able to deal with the extreme forces exerted on it at liftoff. All this activity is performed with the goal of getting Neutron ready for its first flight next year. Currently, Rocket Lab hopes to fly one neutron test flight in 2025, followed by three flights in 2026, and five flights in 2027. And it's already found a customer for two of those missions. For now, Rocket Lab is mainly focusing on flying in 2025, as that's what's required for Neutron to be selected by the U.S. Space Force for a contract under the National Security Space Launch Program. The company believes it'll make that deadline, as the program is currently on schedule. If you want to follow along with Neutron, as well as other space news, give this video a like, subscribe, and hit the bell to be notified when we post our next spaceflight update. The European Space Agency wants reusable, super heavy lift rockets, so last year it contracted two companies to develop their ideas, Ariane Group and Rocket Factory Augsburg, or RFA. This study is named European Reusable and Cost-Effective Heavy Lift Transport Investigation, or PROTEIN for short. Yeah, well, ESA took a rather unique approach to naming that one, but the results are in, and besides the linguistic contortionism, the study has already surfaced some other interesting ideas. The companies were tasked with coming up with a rocket concept that could launch a space-based solar electricity generator and a space-based data center. These projects were previously studied by the European space industry. RFA proposed a rocket with two configurations having either two or three stages. Both configurations are seven meters in diameter, similar to Rocket Lab's Neutron and Blue Origin's New Glenn, but they'll be much taller. The two-stage configuration comes in at 130 meters, and the third stage adds an extra 10 meters to that. If the rocket stages land downrange, these configurations can bring 100 tons and 115 tons to low Earth orbit. The first stage of RFA's rocket concept is powered by the Prometheus engine, which ESA is currently working on. They run on methane, and this stage needs 30 of them. The second stage will be powered by a hydrogen version of RFA's own Helix engine. Like RFA, Ariane Group also landed on a rocket concept with two variants. The company's original fully reusable concept was not well adapted to both use cases suggested by ESA, so they proposed a new concept with a semi-reusable variant that offers better performance to sun-synchronous and geostationary orbit. This rocket is about 100 meters tall and 8.5 meters wide, slightly smaller than Starship. The semi-reusable version only has a reusable 
first stage and can lift 100 tons into low Earth orbit. Like RFA's concept, this variant uses methane on the first stage and hydrogen on the second. Both stages will also be powered by Prometheus. The fully reusable version shares the same first stage but has a methane-powered reusable upper stage, which is based on Ariane Group's existing Smart Upper Stage for Innovative Exploration concept, or SUSY. While it doesn't have the performance power of the semi-reusable version, it does of course have the advantage of being fully reusable. Now all of these rockets are just concepts that the companies claim that they can build and deliver by 2035. And while neither of these concepts is being built just yet, the protein studies have shown ESA that the European space industry just might be able to deliver reusable super heavy lift vehicles within a decade, at least under the right conditions. This is just one of the many steps that ESA has recently taken towards reusability. While they currently have access to space, reusability could make it much cheaper and more frequent. But will it? ESA's own news release on this study probably sums it up best by saying, quote, the protein studies show we can do it. The next step is political will. This week, we also got updates on reusable super heavy lift rockets from China, as more details on the Changzhang 9 rocket were revealed. At 114 meters tall and 10.6 meters in diameter, it's a truly massive rocket, and it has the potential to add to China's lunar capability with the power to launch up to 50 tons into lunar transfer. Designs for the Changzhang 9 have been going around since 2009, but the concept has changed a lot over the years. The current iteration is outfitted with 30 methane-powered first-stage engines and has a reusable first stage that will land on a catching system suspended between four towers. There are multiple variants planned, one with three stages, one with two stages, and another two-stage variant with a reusable upper stage. It's also pretty safe to assume where the developers got their inspiration from for the last variant because it looks a heck of a lot like Starship. Currently, the first launch of a reusable booster is planned for 2030, and the fully reusable two-stage version is expected between 2033 and 2035. Notably, this is earlier than expected, as only last year the rocket was expected to debut in 2033. Another rocket update came from the Chinese company Caspace, which is working on a kerosene-powered medium lift rocket called Kinetica 2, or Legion 2. This is the company's second rocket after the solid-fueled Kinetica 1, which is also known as Legion 1. And it just so happened that that rocket launched this week, but more on that later. Kinetica 2 is not ready to fly just yet, but this week, Caspace announced that it's aiming to get the rocket ready for its first flight by September of 2025. The company has now completed the design phase and it has started production on the rocket and the ground equipment. Eventually, the rocket's first stage is also supposed to be reusable. However, it will likely look just a bit different than what you might expect, as the three first stage boosters will separate and land as one piece. And finally, China's state-owned Aviation Industry Corporation of China, or AVIC, brought us some good news for fans of space planes. AVIC revealed a reusable cargo space plane called How Long. The spacecraft is outfitted with a pair of rotatable wings, so it'll easily fit in a fairing during launch, while still allowing the wings to provide enough lift when the space plane comes back to land on an airport runway. The space plane is about 10 meters long by 8 meters wide, and weighs less than half as much as the Tianzhou cargo spacecraft that currently resupplies the Tiangong space station. When it gets online, the How Long will be able to shuttle cargo to and from Tiangong at low cost. And now we'll take a glimpse at some other stories across space, starting with SpaceX's launches from Vandenberg. After a number of headaches regarding approvals and even some political back and forth, SpaceX has received approval to launch 50 times a year from Vandenberg up from the 36 times a year that they were previously approved for. The company had been undergoing a lengthy environmental assessment process with the Space Force to be allowed to increase its launch cadence from the U.S. West Coast. After all of that, earlier this month, it finally received a finding of no significant impact, or FONSI, that determined that the increase in launch cadence would not impact the environment and are therefore cleared to perform more launches from there. The 1,444 page long document, yes, that's 1444, you heard it right, goes into all of the details of how this increase in cadence will affect the environment, from sonic booms, water, pollutants, and so forth. Interestingly, one of the other things that it says is that SpaceX intends to increase this number to 100 launches per year in the future once Space Launch Complex 6 is activated to launch Falcon rockets. It surely is about to get busy on the West Coast. VAST is making progress on its Haven 1 space station. This single module space station is the first in a series of commercial space stations planned 
planned by the company and is slated to launch next year. Last month, the company showed off the station's final interior design, and this week, Vast announced that it's finishing up the welds on the qualification primary structure for Haven 1. Once this structure is completed, it'll be moved to the company's test facility in Mojave for a series of tests. These tests will prove that the station can, quote, handle the pressure and dynamic loads of launch and operation. Vast hopes to send astronauts to Haven 1 for at least a few two-week missions. One of these astronauts might be Czech astronaut Aleš Svoboda, who currently is a reserve astronaut for the European Space Agency. This week, Vast and the Czech Republic's Ministry of Transport signed a Memorandum of Understanding to partner on future human spaceflight projects. Under this partnership, Vast might send Svoboda up to Haven 1 or the International Space Station on a SpaceX Dragon. Interestingly, Czechia has also recently signed a similar agreement with Axiom Space so it looks like Svoboda will be going to space one way or another. This week, we got more news from Spanish launch company PLD Space. The company is slowly making its way through the development of its Miura 5 rocket, and they announced this week that they finally completed the structural test stand for it. This will be the site where PLD Space will be able to qualify and complete structural acceptance testing of vehicle tanks before final integration and flight. The 20-meter tall structure is located at the company's test site at the Teruel Airport in Spain, about 240 kilometers from the manufacturing facility in Elche. Within the structure, tanks will be filled with cryogenic propellants and will be subjected to forces akin to those during flight. The company already warned us to stay tuned for footage of that, and we'll definitely hold them to their word. One of the steps coming up for PLD Space will also be the qualification and acceptance testing of the turbo pump assembly for the rocket's engines, so here's hoping that we also get to see more updates about that as well. And speaking of showing off rocket engines, Stoke Space also posted pictures on social media of the Block 2 version of the engine for its first stage of its upcoming Nova rocket. What's more, this is the actual flight design that the engine will consist of whenever that rocket launches. Now, if you remember, the company had already built an earlier design of this engine, which was a lot messier, and which Stoke's CEO referred to as the breadboard engine. Despite that, the engine was still test-fired, and now the company has clearly evolved from it to an actual flight engine that they've not only manufactured, but it's already on the test stand. This is also a brand new vertical test stand, which Stoke had built in nearly record time at its test site in Moses Lake. In the test stand pictures, we can see that there are a myriad of sensors that'll help Stoke carefully understand and gather lots of data about the engine as it's being tested there. Hopefully we'll get to see beautiful blue and red fire from it in the near future. And another rocket that we want to see Blue Fire from is Blue Origin's new Glenn rocket. This week, the company announced on social media that it has finally made it the first stages for New Glenn's first flight. The update obviously came with a picture showing the two stages together inside of the horizontal integration facility at Blue's launch site at Launch Complex 36. CEO Dave Limp also shared an extra photo showing the two BE-3U engines on the second stage prior to mating. This second stage had previously been moved to the pad in the summer and had been test-fired ahead of flight. These engines now sport their large nozzle extensions, which Limp said make the entire nozzle 114.5 inches long, or 2.9 meters. This is just another one of the many steps to get New Glenn into flight. And in the coming days and weeks, we should see the rollout of this rocket to the pad for stack testing and a static fire test of the booster. We'll definitely be keeping an eye out for all of that, thanks to our Space Coast Live cameras in Florida. Now let's take a look at the space traffic this week and see what's coming up next week in spaceflight. This week was quite a busy one, and it started off with the Changzheng 2C launching from China. Liftoff took place on November 9th at 3.39 UTC from South Launch Site 2 at the Jochuan Satellite Launch Center. The rocket was carrying four PiSat satellites into sun-synchronous orbit. PiSat satellites are synthetic aperture radar satellites in X-band that fly in a wheel pattern formation around the Earth. In this formation, one of them, which is called the Master Satellite, is positioned at the center of the wheel, with the other three, called assistant satellites, flying in formation around it. This type of flight allows the satellites to perform interferometric synthetic aperture radar observations of the ground via their X-band radar systems at millimeter level precision. Going from China to California, a few hours later we had the first of five Falcon 9 launches this week. Liftoff took place on November 9th at 6.14 UTC from Space Launch Complex 4 East in Vandenberg. For this mission, Falcon 9 was carrying 20 Starlink satellites. 13 of them were direct to cell and the other seven were Starlink V2 mini satellites. The first stage for this mission, B-1081, was flying for an 11th time and it successfully landed on SpaceX's drone ship, Of Course I Still Love You. A few days later, from China again, we 
had the launch of a Kinetica 1 rocket, also known as Legion 1, with a set of ride-sharing satellites. Liftoff took place on November 11th at 4.03 UTC from Site 130 at the Jochuan Satellite Launch Center. This mission, the fifth for the Kinetica 1 rocket, saw 15 different satellites launched into a sun-synchronous orbit, and all but three of them were Earth observation satellites. Some of them focused on remote sensing, such as the two Jilin-1 satellites flying on the mission, along with the Tianyan-24 satellite and the Oman IRSS-1 OL-1 satellite, which was the first foreign satellite launched by a Chinese commercial space company. Other Earth observation satellites on board included the two Shiguang-1 satellites for commercial high resolution resolution methane source detection, and the deployment of six Yunya-1 weather satellites. Along for the ride were also three satellites called Xiyan 26A, 26B, and 26C, which have been classed as experimental test satellites. Later that day, we had another Falcon 9, the second of the week, from Florida. Liftoff took place on November 11th at 1722 UTC from Launch Complex 39A at NASA's Kennedy Space Center. The mission was carrying the Koreasat 6A satellite into a geosynchronous transfer orbit. Koreasat 6A is a three and a half ton satellite manufactured by Talis Alenia space for KTSAT, a South Korean communications company. Once at its orbital slot in geostationary orbit, the satellite will deliver broadcast communication services to South Korea, replacing the aging Koreasat-6 satellite. The first stage for this mission, B-1067, was flying for its 23rd time, and it successfully returned to SpaceX's landing Zone 1 ground pad at the Cape, making it the first booster to fly and land 23 times. Just a few hours later, we had another Falcon 9 from neighboring Pad 40 at the Cape. Liftoff took place on November 11th at 2128 UTC, carrying another batch of 24 Starlink V2 mini satellites into low Earth orbit. The first stage for this mission, B-1080, was flying for a 12th time, and it successfully landed on SpaceX's drone ship A Short Fall of Gravitas. This week, we also had the launch of a Chongzheng 4B rocket on November 13th at 2242 UTC from the Taiyuan Satellite Launch Center in China. The rocket was carrying the Haiyang 401 satellite into a sun-synchronous orbit. This satellite is an oceanography satellite, the first of a new generation of Chinese Earth observation satellites aimed at studying the oceans. This will boost and upgrade the country's capability to monitor ocean salinity and marine ecosystems, as well as perform long-term climate change research. Coming back to the United States, we had another Falcon 9 launch from Vandenberg. Liftoff took place on November 14th at 523 UTC, carrying another batch of Starlink satellites, seven of them being Starlink V2 Mini and 13 being direct-to-cell satellites. The booster for this mission, B-1082, was flying for an eighth time, and it successfully landed on SpaceX's drone ship, Of Course I Still Love You. And a few hours later, the fifth and final Falcon 9 launch happened from Florida. The mission started on November 14th at 1321 UTC from Space Launch Complex 40, and it carried another 24 Starlink V2 mini satellites into orbit. The first stage for this mission, B-1076, was flying for an 18th time, and it successfully landed on SpaceX's drone ship Just Read the Instructions. This mission marked the 17th launch by SpaceX over a period of 31 days, a record for the company thus far. This kind of cadence, if prolonged over an entire year could allow SpaceX to launch up to 200 times per year. That's a lot. With the four Starlink satellites this week, SpaceX has now launched a total of 7,324 satellites, of which 667 have re-entered and 6,014 have entered their operational orbit. And to wrap up the very active week of launches, this morning we had the launch of a Chongzheng 7 rocket from China carrying the next Tianzhou cargo resupply spacecraft to the Tiangong Space Station. The Tianzhou 8 spacecraft is carrying about 7 tons of cargo for the crew of Shenzhou 19, who are currently living and working on board the station. The vehicle also carries cargo for the next crew complement, Shenzhou 20, which should be launching in spring of next year. Going into next week, we'll have a lot more launches, so get ready. The first of these is expected to be a Falcon 9 from Florida carrying the Optus X satellite into geosynchronous transfer orbit. The 118-minute launch window for this mission is set to open on November 17th at 2129 UTC. After that, there will be another Falcon 9 launch from Vandenberg, carrying another batch of Starlink satellites. The four-hour launch window for this one is set to open on November 18th at 547 UTC. And coming back to Florida, another Falcon 9 will launch carrying the next communication satellite for India's space agency, GSAT-20. The roughly two-hour window is set to open on November 18th at 1831 UTC. Also next week will be the sixth launch of SpaceX's Starship rocket from Starbase in Texas. If hardware and weather cooperate, this could take place as early as November 18th with the 30-minute launch window set to open at 2200 UTC. 
Next week, we might also have the next launch of Rocket Lab's HASTE program, which makes use of electron rockets in suborbital trajectories to test hypersonic technologies. That launch is expected to take place from Wallops no earlier than midnight UTC on November 20th. After that, we'll have the next launch of a Progress cargo resupply vehicle to the International Space Station. The Progress MS-29 spacecraft is set to lift off from Baikonur on November 21st at 1222 UTC and should be docking to the orbiting laboratory about two days later. And at the end of the week, we'll have another Falcon 9 with even more Starlink satellites launching from Florida. The four-hour launch window is set to open on November 21st at 1553 UTC. And that's your weekly update of spaceflight news. I'm Alicia Siegel for NSF, and I'll see you all again next week to recap this week in spaceflight.